St. Paul wrote to St. Timothy, Know this also, that in the last days shall come dangerous times. I charge thee before God and Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead by his coming and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, re-entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine. For there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and will indeed turn away their hearing from the truth, but will be turned unto fables. But be thou vigilant, labor in all things, doing the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, be sober. I would like to begin this conference with a little apology. In the first place, I am sorry, I really am, I'm serious. I'm sorry that what I am presenting today on fantasy literature, myths, And Gnosticism is so late in coming. It seems to me most of this information should have been made known much sooner and at more authoritative levels. Second, what I am presenting may not be easy for some to hear. Many, many good and well-intentioned Catholics Love the works of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. Is it not true? So much so, this subject has become a sort of sacred cow. Sad to say, as a result, many of these well-intentioned Catholics are more prepared, more prepared, to defend these modern literary works than they are the sacred scriptures or the dogmas of the church. For example, they'll put up with people saying, oh, the Bible's got errors. Well, you know, what can I say? (laughs) Tolkien's got a problem. Oh, yeah? Such a reaction is always a sign that something is not quite right. Third, I'm speaking from personal experience. As I myself was very much captivated by the fantasy works of both Lewis and Tolkien for many years. It was my custom for over a decade to read or listen to The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, at least once a year. I listened to all the versions too, the unabridged version, the BBC dramatized versions, as well as the other American productions. Anything that was available... I also listened to Tolkien's Silmarillion two times. Try that. It's pretty heavy-duty stuff. It's really weird. It took a lot to get through it. Only after a priest friend worked on me for some time did I finally start to take a closer look at what was going on in these works. Did I finally start to discern the spirits? At the time of this conversion, I was working for some cloistered nuns and sought to pray as much as they did. Didn't want to let them outdo me. After all, I was their chaplain. This quiet time and long periods of mental prayer allowed me to discern many things as St. Ignatius had done so long ago. Reflecting on the advice of the priest and noting the ill effects of my annual listening to the Lord of the Rings, I finally received the strength and the courage to destroy my audios of this series, of all my series. As a result, almost immediately, I was granted a special grace confirming my decision. I was free. Since then, I have found other trustworthy and faithful souls, among them some very good priests, who have experienced similar things. In this way, I knew I was on the right path. But why? That is what I hope to reveal now. But to do this well, let us begin with a little disclaimer. I am not here to condemn J.R.R. Tolkien, nor those who are, from all I can gather, misled in promoting his works as being authentically Catholic. 
And here I'm referring especially to the good-hearted Mr. Joseph Pierce. Now to prepare this talk, I listened to his eight-part course on the Lord of the Rings, as well as other talks, and read various interviews he has given. I've also looked through various parts of his books and articles on this subject, and I owe him much in understanding Tolkien better. But at the same time, I am also here to fulfill my duty as a priest of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, whose responsibility it is to be vigilant in protecting the faithful from what is potentially dangerous, what is of fables, as St. Paul says, and not of sound doctrine. As St. Paul says, these are dangerous times. We heard it at the beginning of this conference. That means good people can be misled very easily. There is a revolution going on and it has reached the highest levels in history. We're neck deep in toxic waters. How easy it is to take a drink and become intoxicated. To become captivated. Consider a few very serious examples. I very much appreciate the Catholic physicist and author Dr. Wolfgang Smith. He wrote an excellent treatise printed by Tan Books, Unmasking Teilhard de Chardin and His New Religion of Evolution. He has also written many profound articles on contemporary science as viewed in the light of tradition. Some of them gathered in one volume entitled The Wisdom of Ancient Cosmology. Yet in this book, he has a section where he discusses German theosophy. And a man named Jacob Beam, 16th century, mystic contemplative of the devil. He received mystic revelations about the universe. Both of these are occult. Enlightenment, in other words, coming from below rather than from above. That's what I mean when I say occult. Hidden, special knowledge and enlightenment coming from down there, not up there. These things, Jacob Beam, German theosophy, they are outside the safe boundaries of the church. Clearly, the good doctor, Dr. Wolfgang Smith, who we are going to use to help us later in these conferences, he was considering things outside the boundaries of the church. These are not safe sources. These are dangerous times when such good men can so easily make a mistake. Another example. Perhaps you've heard of the author Louis de Waal. He wrote many historical novels on the lives of the saints and various historical personages. King David, St. Paul, Constantine, St. Benedict, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis de Sales, St. Catherine, and many others. I've read every one of his books just about. Yet he is an avowed astrologist. Writing a book defending astrology in the 1930s called Secret Service of the Sky. He entitled his autobiography, I Follow My Star. Louis de Waal worked for MI5, that's England's Secret Service, during World War II using astrology. If I'm not mistaken, he predicted the death of Hitler using astrology. He also wrote a novel on a spiritual battle between a Catholic astrologer. It was against a sort of antichrist witch. The name of this book was called Strange Daughter. I read that too. He was the astrologer in the story. He's a good man. Yet looking in unsafe places. St. Augustine, who once dabbled in astrology before his conversion, glorified the wise and loving providence of God as opposed to the fatalistic notions captured by astrology. Yet with the 19th century revival of the occult, astrology is back. These are dangerous times. 
To counter these revolutionary ideas, the First Vatican Council had to repeat the teaching that God, through His providence, protects and guides all that He created. The church has always shunned astrology while promoting trust and abandonment to divine providence. Good men looking in the wrong places, dangerous times. Another example. Karavoitia, Pope John Paul II, as a young man used to act in Dr. Kotelarchek's Rhapsodic Theater, especially during the Nazi occupation of Poland. Kotelarchek, he focused on the mystery of the intoned word. Hmm. Mystery of the intoned word. Kotelarchek then was working primarily with the mechanics of the voice, emotion, expression. Later, he wrote a book called The Art of the Living Word. 1975, it was published, in which he openly discussed the contributions of magic and the arcane. When we use that word arcane, we're talking about the esoteric, secret, obscure, the occult. Think about it. What do occultists do but utter words that seemingly cause something to happen? Of special note here, among the many arcane works Kotelarchek draws upon, include those of the leading occultist, Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. She died in the year 1891. Now, by the way, Cardinal Wojtyla, back in the 1970s, wrote a preface to this work of Kotelarchek. Again, we see what appears to be men of goodwill, yet looking for things in the wrong places. These are dangerous times, dangerous times. One last example. Once when visiting the chapel of a religious house in the Midwest... I was taken in by the beauty of the Italian marble altar and the baldacchino covered with mosaics. Yet after being shown beyond any shadow of a doubt that the whole thing was actually a rosy crucian Freemasonic work of art. The whole altar, proven to be such by various experts and exorcists, it struck me square in the face how dangerous these times really are. At first sight, this altar looked very Catholic. But on closer inspection, it was not Catholic at all. Danger. Danger. Vigilance is needed. And these are only a few examples of how easily we can be deceived with what looks like a good thing at first. But upon closer inspection, is contrary and toxic to our faith. What is offensive to God and His church. So now, let's begin our exposition of fantasy literature by doing what St. Paul said, namely, using doctrine, that is, the rule of faith, to make proper correction. St. Paul said, you heard him, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, entreat, rebuke in all patience and doctrine, for there shall be a time when they will not endure sound doctrine. What word is he talking of here but the word of God, God's word, God's divine revelation? In this word, In this revelation is contained all we need to be sanctified and saved in this life. It is the wellspring of all happiness, of all peace for our souls. This revelation, this word is only found in the deposit of the faith in the Catholic Church. So we must start here. We must always have recourse to doctrine of our holy and infallible faith to survive these dangerous times. Now, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, St. Ignatius teaches something similar in the first of his rules for thinking with the church. He says, putting aside all private judgment, we should keep our minds prepared and ready to obey promptly 
and in all things the true spouse of Christ our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church, St. Ignatius of Loyola. Thus, what we're saying is this. If we find any author contradicting the doctrines of the church that have been defined, that have been established and written down and given to us, then we know we have a problem. In other words, I'm not talking about St. Thomas Aquinas and those like him who taught something they thought was right before the church taught it definitively. They made a mistake. That can happen. I'm talking about clearly defined truths of the faith, someone coming along and telling you something different. When that happens, the integral good of the work is lost. Okay? The integral good of that work is lost and should be approached with great care and caution, if not altogether rejected as harmful to the faith. Even though we may enjoy the work, we may find it fascinating, captivating, and exciting. We must put aside our private judgment and put aside our emotions in order to conform ourselves to our Holy Mother, the Church, and live by faith. Now, turning to our subject today, it is well established that J.R.R. Tolkien, a philologist, someone who studied words and languages, enjoyed researching and discussing mythology, especially of Northern Europe, but also of Greece and other places. As a result, he developed a sort of philosophy of myth, philosophy of myth while shunning allegory. He said, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations. He criticized C.S. Lewis and others like George MacDonald for their too transparent allegories and resisted all attempts to make his own works allegorical. Here we already have a problem. Why? Because simply this, God loves allegory. God loves allegory. He placed allegories in the scriptures, as St. Paul explains in the letter to the Galatians and in other places. Thus, one of the main ways to interpret the sacred scriptures is called the allegorical sense. A whole school of thought in the early church, the Alexandrian school, has contributed many things to the exposition of the scriptures using allegory. The fathers of the church, the doctors and the saints employed allegory to explain the faith. This is not something to demean or to despise. Regardless of how well or poorly various authors, whether modern or medieval, have used allegories. In other words, you may not like this particular allegory, but you must never say you don't like allegory in all its manifestations. By saying that, guess what? You just missed a whole element of understanding the Scriptures and our faith. Danger. Now, there is more to this. According to Joseph Pierce, Tolkien thought that myth was a better way to transmit various high-level truths. Okay, I'm going to quote him. Joseph Pierce, quote, Tolkien believed that mythology was a means of conveying certain transcendent truths which are almost inexpressible within the factual confines of a realistic novel. End quote. In another place, Joseph Pierce, for Tolkien, myth was the only way that certain transcendent truths could be expressed in intelligible form. Let me repeat it. For Tolkien, myth was the only way that certain transcendent truths could be expressed in intelligible form. Hmm. I hope your alarm bells are going off. This is a sign of modern revolutionary thinking which teaches that only in recent times have we finally figured out how to transmit those transcendent truths. 
You mean we've got it wrong all these centuries? We've not been able to transmit the truths of Christ for 20 centuries? Wow. Where is this coming from? All this time we have failed. Does this make sense? No, this is false. In order to see what I'm saying here, let's stop just for a moment to see and consider that millions, millions, millions upon millions of people have read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. It was so popular back in the 1960s that booksellers, especially those on college campuses, did not even bother to place them on the shelves. Instead, they just stacked them by the checkout stand. Ballantine Books estimated over 50 million people had read The Lord of the Rings by 1968. 50 million people. 150 million are said to have read it by the year 2011. Soon, hobbitry became a way of life with hobbit parties, talking societies springing up. It's even made its way into religious life today. I've heard of hobbits and habit. Hobbits and habits. I've been called one myself. So avid of a reader was I. I've seen many Photoshop pictures of nuns as elves and hobbits, and maybe you have too. Hobbits in habits. In the 1960s, graffiti from coast to coast read, Gandalf for president. Come to Middle Earth. An American Green Beret officer translated the book into Vietnamese and distributed it to top South Vietnamese officers. Tolkien was inundated with offers by toy makers and movie producers and television executives all hoping in to cash in on the book's success. Even the Beatles approached Tolkien to make a movie of The Lord of the Rings with John Lennon, the most avid Tolkien reader among them, as Gollum. Paul McCartney as Frodo. Ringo Starr as Sam and George Harrison playing Gandalf. There was even a North Borneo Frodo society. In London, rock clubs picked up the vibe with places like Middle Earth and Gandalf's Garden catering to aspiring hobbits. These were cafes for those who were on drugs. Various psychedelic rock bands sprang up taking names from Tolkien's work like Gandalf. They recorded one album for Capitol Records in 1969. Gandalf the Grey on Gandalf Wizard Records appeared in 1972. In 1970, a a band named Khazad Doom. It's a city in the mines of Moria, Tolkien's Middle Earth. They released one album, and there's been many more since. Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, known occultist, known Satanist, two favorite books. Aleister Crowley's Thelema, and J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Think about it. All this over The Lord of the Rings. Millions upon millions read these works. And yet, where are the conversions? Instead of coming to Christ, they're going to rock and roll. If this mythology of Tolkien is supposed to be more effective in transmitting high-level truths about God, where are the effects? By the way, this is a really gross album cover for the Beatles. These are fake babies, but look how they're dismembered along with uh, ribs and stuff of cows. Does this look like the kind of guys you want to listen to? These are your friends? These guys are Satanists. You know who their father was? Aleister Crowley. He was the master that taught the band to play. The atheistic leaning Edith Stein read the autobiography of St. Teresa of Jesus in one night. By morning, she was Catholic. A few years later, she entered a convent and died a cruel death for our holy faith. She is only one among many thousands 
many such conversions from reading the works of the saints, like Teresa of Jesus. Among all the millions of avid Tolkien readers, is there anyone who came to the truths of our faith through these books? I know of none. What does this mean? It seems clear to me that these books, these myths of Middle-earth, are not channels of grace. They do not effectively transmit high-level truths that convert souls. To see how this is true, let us focus our attention on the definition and use of myth. In general, myths are fictitious narratives or fables which seek to explain how the world and humanity come to be in their present form by including the roles of supernatural persons, including roles and actions or events of these supernatural persons. They embody some popular ideas concerning nature or historical events. Underline that. They embody popular ideas concerning nature and historical events. Many myths appear in cultures to explain their beginnings, inevitably touching upon cosmic and human origins as well as other important subjects like the origins of human institutions. For man's quest for happiness and his success and failure in finding it, for example... Freemasonry. Freemasonry is very much based on the myth concerning Solomon's temple. In other words, Masons love myths. Hmm. Historically, the particular focus of a myth is to show how the gods relate with man and nature. Among the most famous myths we have are those of the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Romans. When looking at the historical development and the use of myths, it is very important to know that no one traces any of them back to the sacred scriptures. Because the Bible contains no myths. Only recently have the modernist scholars tried to force the category of myth upon the Bible, especially Genesis 1-11, through and the plagues of Exodus. In other words, these so-called scripture scholars have tried to say the sacred writers of the Bible were not original, but rather borrowed much from the ancient myths of their own time. Therefore, much of their writing was mythical. God save us from such men. And Pope Pius XII did just that. Addressing this issue in the encyclical, Humani Generis, Number 39, he said, Whatever of the popular narration have been inserted into the sacred scripture must in no way be considered on a par with myths or other such things, which are more the product of an extravagant imagination than of striving for truth and simplicity, which in the sacred books, including the Old Testament, is so apparent that our, sacred, uh, that our ancient sacred writers must be admitted to be clearly superior to the ancient profane writers. Thank you, Pope Pius XII of happy memory. What is he saying? There are no myths in the Bible. No myths in the entire Bible. What we find there is superior to such forms. Myths are, he says, more the product of an extravagant imagination than that of striving for truth and simplicity. Listen to the prophet Baruch. He's writing to those in the Babylonian exile. He says, the children of Hagar that search after the wisdom that is of the earth and the tellers of fables and searchers of prudence and understanding, but the way of wisdom they have not known, neither have they remembered her paths. 
In other words, there is very little striving for truth in fables and myths outside the church. Second, we should note well that every time the apostles Peter and Paul employ the Greek word mythos in the Greek, mythos, myth, it is pejorative. Pejorative. They're attacking it. Here's a sampling. St. Peter. For we have not by following artificial fables, mythos, made known to you the power and the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his greatness. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. His, this voice coming down to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. 2 Peter chapter 1. Okay. Christ is the Word incarnate. And there are no myths in this Word. Listen to him. St. Paul. He mentions mythos four times in his writings. All pejorative. Every one of them. To St. Timothy, we heard at the start of this conference. Namely, how many will turn away indeed their hearing from the truth and will be turned unto fables, mythos. Here's another example from his letter to St. Titus. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, mythos. Put a bookmark there. We're going to return to that. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn themselves away from the truth. It's clear. The church and the Scriptures seem to be saying the same thing. Myths, that is, artificial fables, the work of an extravagant imagination, are not safe pathways to the truth. They're not safe pathways for transmitting truth. Now, maybe some may object here, saying, well, there's various mythical references in the Bible. What of the unicorn mentioned by King David? What about fawns by the prophet Jeremiah? And what about that Leviathan mentioned by King David and others? When we look into these matters with the help of the fathers of the church, as well as the doctors and saints, we find the unicorn is the rhinoceros. And Leviathan, a whale or a dinosaur, fawns and the like, demonic manifestations. These are not mythical. They're real. In any case, it is easy to see why there are no myths in the Scripture. Because we have the real thing, folks. We don't need myths. God our Father is the Creator. We know what He has done with certainty because He told us. And it is wonderful to behold. We know how He works with men in His creation because He told us. We don't need any myth. We have the Word incarnate. Hear ye Him. Now to carry this yet another step, consider for a moment... None of the fathers of the church, nor any of the saints, has ever taken up myths of old as something good. Something to be commented upon. Or something to be imitated as a way to transmit some truth. Hmm. According to the renowned expert on the church fathers, Johannes Quaston, the early Greek apologist like St. Justin Martyr, who he says had an excellent knowledge of Greek mythology, exposed the absurdities and immoralities of the paganism and the myths of its divinities, and at the same time demonstrating that the Christian alone has the correct understanding of God and the universe. Quaston also explains how Pope St. Clement I, in his work, Exhortation to the Greeks, contains a polemic against the ancient mythologies. While defending the greater antiquity of the Old Testament, St. Clement, right from the very beginning, he's one of the popes, he says the Catholic authors, the Christian authors, the old authors of the Bible, ancient authors, are superior to those profane authors. Pope Pius XII is vindicated. 
Later, when some Neoplatonists tried to recover various Greek myths by giving them allegorical interpretations, St. Eusebius of Caesarea exposed their folly and refuted them in his work, Preparation for the Gospel. And what is he saying? Myths are not preparation for the Gospel. And so on with the other fathers of the church. Now, when reflecting on the works of the saints, I don't know, I cannot find, I can't think of one who wrote a myth or a fable to transmit truth. There was Dante's Divine Comedy, but that's an epic poem that's allegorical. It's not mythical. Then there was St. Thomas More's Utopia, famous book, but it was a novel and has by no means disconnected from the world. By no means was it attempting to show the origins of any kind. In fact, it spawned all sorts of profound discussions on important matters touching on human life and the state. It was not mythical. St. Teresa of Jesus wrote a novel as a teenager, but later totally disapproved of all novels and prevented her sisters from ever reading such low-level works in her caramels. St. John Bosco, he had those dreams, or those myths, they were very vivid. Again, they were not myths, but real visions that touched upon the life of the church and something in the future regarding the church which are still to be fulfilled. Kind of scary, if you've ever read them. In a word, what I'm saying is this, I cannot find any example of saints using myths or fables to transmit truths. Yet, there are the works of the 14th century Dominican Meister Eckhart. Apparently, he tried to revive the use of myth and Christianize them. Now, he died in the year 1327. His works were put on trial and condemned for the presence of many errors. It should come as no surprise to find various heretical philosophers of the 19th century, as well as Madame Helena Blavatsky's Theosophical Society, reviving and adopting these works, using his ideas. Many other New Age thinkers, like the apostate father Matthew Fox, have promoted Meister Eckhart. Obviously, we're forced to conclude that the saints did not consider the myth able to convey truth, whereas the heretics did. The church and history have spoken, and they have shown us the saints are right. Now, it should be noted that Joseph Pierce says over and over again, how misunderstood Tolkien is. He even says he's misunderstood. Now, if you know anything about the heretics, you ever study heretics in the history of the church? They always claim, oh, I misunderstood. Now, the main reason he gives this for this breakdown in understanding is this. Tolkien had a different, more elevated understanding of myth. Yet here again, we're on the ground of modern erroneous ways of thinking, which always tries to do what? Redefine terms. And give new meanings to words while keeping the word itself. Once again, all these centuries, we just didn't get our understanding of myth right. Only with Tolkien, now we got it right. Does this make sense to you? All those saints, Pope Clement, you didn't know what you were doing. Justin Martyr, St. Irenaeus. I understand myth. I'm going to give you a new understanding of it. I'm going to show you that they're good. Ding, 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 ding. Modern. Modernism. The facts we've already gathered speak for themselves. Myths are not safe avenues for transmitting truth. And it seems clear to me that Tolkien has proved this like no one has ever done before. 
Think about it. 150 million people have read his Lord of the Rings and other books. As a result, a whole industry has grown up around them. Movies, a whole spread of fantasy writers has sprung up. New myths have come about because of him. And there's these games and videos and so on. This stuff is big business. Millions of dollars are being spent in, over this. In the bedrooms of our youth, we find full-size posters of actors from the Lord of the Rings who are known to live perverted lives and hold positions contrary to Christ and His church. And through all this activity, the church has not increased in size, but rather more and more of her members have fallen away and even apostatized. These fruits speak for themselves. The notion of myth, even its so-called elevated views, as held by Tolkien and promoted by Joseph Pierce, has not helped the church in this time of great trial. In order to solidify this conclusion and confirm our faith, we must now turn our attention to the actual fantasy works of Tolkien. I will also touch briefly on other fantasy writers like C.S. Lewis when fitting. Again, we have to pause for a moment because some try to say that Tolkien's works are not fantasy, but really mythical. Trying to take two words or two descriptions of the same thing and say, well, they're, two, they're very different. That's fantasy over there. This is myth over here. Tolkien's over here. He's not fantasy. Because why? Because you know fantasy's got problems, right? Yet fantasy as a category of literature is defined as imaginative fiction involving magic and adventure, especially in a setting other than the real world. Hmm. That covers nearly everything that both Tolkien and Lewis have presented. Imaginative, fictional, magical and otherworldly. Need more to be said? Myth and fantasy cover the same ground. In fact, Tolkien's myth is more aligned with fantasy than the ancient myths because why? His world is even more removed, even more imaginative and divorced from our own than those of the ancient world unless, God forbid, you say that Tolkien actually tapped into a hidden reality. He was, had the veil removed and he was seeing things. If you think like that, then you're not Catholic. You're an occultist and maybe don't even know it. We must say this stuff he had is fictional. The product of an imaginative mind. Maybe he had help. I don't know. But if you start saying it's not fictional, you're in trouble. And believe me, there are those who say it. They belong to the Gnostic church. Who think everything that we see in reality is like a veil. And in the way of what is real. Very dangerous stuff. Very dangerous. Now, it is well known. To construct his myth of Middle-earth, Tolkien first composed a language and then built up the story around it, creating people who could speak the language. Joseph Pierce goes so far to say that Middle-earth was Tolkien's word made flesh. Put a bookmark there. I hope your bells are going off. Someone is claiming they have a word made flesh. It better be the same word we know. And if it's not, what does that make it? An anti-word. An antichrist. Not surprisingly, as a myth, Tolkien's Middle Earth has a creation story behind it. A cosmology found most fully explained in the Silmarillion. As expected of all myths, this creation story explained, among other things, how the world came to be, how evil entered into it. You know the story. Lewis had to do the same thing with his Narnia tales. 
although not with near the same skill as Tolkien. In Tolkien's creation, he has this one God creating spiritual beings. I'm not going to call him God because it's not our God. He has this one God creating spiritual beings or demiurges, sort of like our angels. This God then shows these demigods the theme of creation and asks them to sing in harmony with that theme. Now, when I first read this, I was taken with it before I knew my Catholic faith and to the level I should have known it. I thought it was, wow, that's fantastic. Well, by their singing, they participate in the creation of the world that will become Middle Earth for elves and men. Now, let's just stop right there. We've already arrived at one of the essential problems of myth. All myths are products of an extravagant mind, an extravagant imagination, and they always become disconnected from the world God truly created. Since they are made-up worlds, they're mythical, can we just put aside the teachings of the church? Can we put aside the teaching of the church on creation? In other words, can heresy be allowed in a mythical world? After all, it's just a fantasy. And of course, the answer is absolutely not. No, we must insist that fantasy or myth is no excuse for heresy, especially if that myth is promoted as being profoundly Christian. Listen to Father Faber. The crowning disloyalty to God is heresy. It is the sin of sins, the very loathsomest of things which God looks down upon in this malignant world. Yet how little do we understand its excessive hatefulness? In other words, God really hates it. It is the polluting of God's truth which is the worst of all impurities. Yet how light we make of it. Oh, Father, it's just a fantasy. You're taking away our fun. We look at it and we're calm. We touch it and do not shudder. We mix with it and we have no fear. We see it touch holy things and we have no sense of sacrilege. We breathe its odor and show no signs of detestation or disgust. Some of us affect its friendship and some even extenuate its guilt. We do not love God enough to be angry for His glory. We do not love men enough to be charitably truthful for their souls. Where there is no hatred of heresy, there is no holiness. What Tolkien has given us here in his creation story is not Catholic. It is Gnostic. This is nothing new that he's given us. The fathers of the church rejected the Gnostic teaching on creation, which holds that the world was made through intermediary beings, demiurges. St. Thomas says, It is impossible for any creature to create either by its own power or instrumentally, that is, ministerially. St. Thomas. Thus we hear the prophet Isaiah say, I am the Lord that made all things. That alone stretch out the heavens and establish the earth. And there is none with me. First Vatican Council repeated the dogma of creation given at the Fourth Lateran Council. God immediately, no help, no mediation, God immediately, from the beginning of time, fashioned each creature out of nothing. Spiritual and corporal namely angelic and mundane, and then the human creation, composed of both spirit and body. Teaching of the church already with this very grave error. We can see that the integral good of Tolkien's works has been lost. He wasn't teaching something that had not been defined. It has been defined. It's not like St. Thomas making a mistake about the Immaculate Conception. This is something Tolkien should have known. 
Tolkien's integral good of his works has been lost. They are dangerous to our faith. There's no excuse for contradicting established teaching of the church. Listen to what some of Tolkien's Catholic followers say of of his ideas. As quoted by Joseph Pierce, Jesuit father James V. Shaw, echoing the views of another Jesuit father, Robert Murray, a friend of Tolkien, they exclaimed, I have never read anything quite so beautiful as the first page of the Silmarillion. The prose are appropriately scriptural. No, sorry, they're Gnostic. They are anti-God. They're anti-scriptural. Another close friend of Tolkien admitted, I am rather fond of the Silmarillion. The idea that God allows the archangels to take part in the creation. It strikes me that his picture of the archangels is surprisingly like small children with their father. All of this is the background to the Lord of the Rings as having been created by the archangels, the Valar, under the direction of the One. Don't you see? Instead of passing on the truth of our holy Catholic faith through his myth, he is promoting heresy. Namely, that of Gnosticism. And it's being well received. Unfortunately, there are many, many more such points in his works. How right was St. Thomas Aquinas when he said a false idea about the nature of creation always reflects itself in a false idea about God. So let's consider a few more of these false ideas. Tolkien has the world unfolding over aeons, thereby supporting the evolutionary ideas of our own time. And I will let Joseph Pierce explain. This is amazing. Quote, Tolkien chose a place for the habitation of the children in the deeps of time and in the midst of the innumerable stars. Thus, in a feat of ingenious invention or sub-creation, Tolkien not only distinguishes the men and elves as being made directly in the image of God, essentially different from the rest of creation, but at the same time accommodates the theory of evolution. The evolution of the cosmos was simply the unfolding of the music of the Ainur, that's the Valar, within which the one places his children in a habitation prepared for them. In a similar feat of ingenuity, this is unbelievable, folks, Tolkien explains that the Valar, the angelic powers given the responsibility of shaping the cosmos, have been, have often been called gods by men. In this way, he manages to accommodate paganism as well as evolution within his mythology, making both subsist within Catholic or Christian orthodoxy. You heard it right. He is saying that with Tolkien, he made evolution and paganism subsist within Christian orthodoxy. Oh, wait a minute. Paganism? Evolutionism? Subsist within Christian orthodoxy? Can we not see how Pierce has fallen into the erroneous idea that pagan polytheism is a preparation for Christianity? A sort of evolution? A sort of evolutionary process of development? Rather than seeing it for what it really is, All the gods of the Gentiles are devils, as King David tells us in the Psalms. These pagan mythologies are devolutions. Devolutions, they're devolutions, not developments. As you know, we and others have spoken many times on the pseudoscience of evolution and its complete lack of orthodoxy. Again, From this we see how the integrity of Tolkien's works are deeply compromised, making them dangerous to read, but popular. What do myths do? They promote a popular understanding of how things are. God started the world perfectly. Then it fell. It's not on its way 
to a perfection, as Teilhard de Chardin thought. No, it's devolving. And God will make a new creation at the end. Let's consider another point, namely that the Middle Earth of Tolkien, death for man is a gift. The death of man is a gift. Yeah, you heard it right. Here's his exact quote. The sons of men die indeed and leave the world, wherefore they are called the guests or the strangers. Death is their fate. The gift of Iluvatar, that's Tolkien's one God which as time wears, even the powers shall envy. But Melkor, that's Tolkien's so-called the devil, cast his shadow upon it and confounded it with darkness and brought evil out of good and fear out of hope. Tolkien, evil out of good. You ever heard about that? I don't know about you. That's strange. That's a disorientation. We don't talk like that. We don't say evil out of good. We say God brings good out of evil. We can say the devil corrupts good. But we never say he brings evil out of good. Something very fishy about this way of speaking. The church teaches that death is a punishment of sin. Listen to the book of wisdom. God made not death. Again, but by the envy of the devil, death came into the world. St. Paul declares, by one man sin entered the world and by sin death. The church teaches us that God gave Adam and Eve what? The gift of immortality. That's the gift we received. Not death. Immortality. Which is completely opposite of what Tolkien is claiming. Again, we see that myth fails miserably to transmit very important truths. It spreads disorientation. Not surprisingly, if someone holds that death is a gift rather than a punishment, then they will most likely hold there's no hell or eternal penalty. No eternal penalty for sin either. Sure enough, for Tolkien's myth, there's no such place, as far as I can tell, as hell. Only the void and only a shadow. When Gandalf confronted the Balrog in the mines of Moria, he does not command as an exorcist would, namely that infernal creature go back to hell. What does he say instead? Go back to the shadow. Go back to the shadow. When Eowyn kills one of the nine black riders, his death is portrayed as a fading voice that was swallowed up and was never heard again in that age of the world. Will it be heard in another age of the world? Will he be able to come back? No mention here of an eternal punishment. Again, Tolkien's myth is not transmitting truth, but rather it seems more apt to transmit error. And heresy. Another essential point. As everyone knows, there is much magic mentioned in the works of both Tolkien and Lewis. Some examples from Tolkien's works are wizards, spells, magical items like rings, staffs, and crystal balls. All of these play a major role in making The Lord of the Rings a successful story. And all of these have always been considered part of the occult by the church. They're of the devil. For his part, Joseph Pierce tries to overcome this difficulty by making a distinction between good and bad magic. The church never accepts this distinction. You will not find in any church teaching or admonition, oh, by the way, there's good magic and there's bad. No. She considers it all from the devil. Joseph Pierce says, It would be more accurate to describe the so-called magic in the Lord of the Rings as miraculous when it serves the good and demonic when it serves the bad. Well, isn't that convenient? So according to Pierce, all the good magic performed by Gandalf and others was really miraculous and not magic at all. 
The church, however, has always held the miraculous as a sensible effect that surpasses nature and is produced by God to witness to some truth or the sanctity of some individual as well as providing a motive for true belief. God works miracles so that people will be strengthened in their faith. They will come to know a truth and they will believe. Thus, the miracle of the sun at Fatima witnessed to the truth of the apparitions to 70,000 viewers, many atheists among them. Yet the Lord of the Rings, there's no mention of God at all. Nor is there mention of faith or belief in God. Neither is there any pointing out the sanctity of individuals. Because there's no mention of holiness in the entire series. Yet Gandalf put closing spells on doors, makes things burn to keep the fellowship warm on the cold mountain, and he lights their way with magic in the dark mines of Moria, breaks the bridge under the Balrog, reads the minds of others, and so on. How are these things in any way, in any way, miraculous, as the church has always understood the word? Again, we're fiddling with words here. We're redefining words to fit what we want. This is very dangerous. What is more, since there is no mention of the supernatural in the whole book, how can anything occurring in the book be considered miraculous at all? The Tolkien myth does, however, indicate that magical actions... Pierce wants to call miraculous, flowed from the power of the ring on Gandalf's finger, the ring of fire, secret fire, and the staff he carried in his hand. It has left nebulous how he tapped into this secret fire. Is this secret fire the Holy Ghost? That's reading things into the story. It's nowhere to be found. It's not indicated. Again, miracles point to God's presence, to God's truth, to God's holy ones. There is no vertical. There's no prayer. There's no mention of grace, the interior life, faith, hope, or charity in these books. Clearly, this distinction of good magic as being the miraculous must be abandoned. It's wrong. Everything in that book is horizontal. That is, it's a struggle between those who have access to secret powers that are within the nature of the mythical world Tolkien has developed. No supernatural is indicated. Now, one clear sign of this is how the rings begin to fail after the one ring is destroyed. And consequently, not much good or bad magic is worked after that point. Maybe in Tolkien's myth there is good and bad magic, but that is far from the case in the real world. All magic is a form of sorcery and relies on demonic powers. Whether the person using the magic accepts that or not, that is the case. Thus, God has always been very strict very strict, in punishing and curtailing all wizards, witches, and all forms of sorcery, even commanding their death according to the law of Moses. Sad to say, this is not a message one will find in the Lord of the Rings. Seems to me that Pierce is reading into the story what he wants it to stay. He's sidestepping a very serious flaw. As for C.S. Lewis, his fantasy works, the Space Trilogy, the Tales of Narnia, are also filled with problems. Not only does he have lots of this good magic, but also has multiple and parallel worlds and life on the planets. In The Magician's Nephew, the children go to a sort of staging ground or intermediate place where there are many, many portals to different worlds some of which have passed away and some of which are just beginning. Thus, in this way, the children are able to be present at the creation of Narnia. This is very problematic since it just programs our children for the ways of modern science, which is all but completely fantasy-based now. 
with all their silly claims of a multiverse or multi-universe, UFOs, and life on other planets. Although Lewis tries hard to incorporate Christian allegory throughout the works, something Tolkien despised, he nevertheless had to use myth to build up his system. And not surprisingly, instead of promoting truth, Lewis's mythical elements promote error and heresy the same as Tolkien's did. Although many more points could be considered, such as how much these myths have been become big business, they sell. Or how this myth is constantly being reintroduced, constantly promoted to keep it going. New books, new movies, new games. Nevertheless, I hope you will agree, we have enough to discern clearly that there is no such thing as Christian myth. It doesn't exist. Willy-nilly, they will produce a world that is in opposition to God's creation. A word made flesh in opposition to Christ. The word of God made flesh. Again, we have the real thing. We do not need myths. Meister Eckhart tried to baptize myth back in the 14th century, and his works were condemned. Myths are dangerous because they disconnect us from reality, from Christ, the Word of God, the real Word. And they try to introduce us into a fantasy land that does not exist Even when such fantasy worlds have many startling representations of various truths, they inevitably introduce error and heresy. Yes, both Tolkien and Lewis have many things that touch on truth. For example, Pierce makes a big deal out of the date of our Lord's incarnation, March 25th, as being the day the ring was destroyed. Now, I don't know about you. I've listened to these works over and over again, and I'm always struck by how out of place that really is. All of a sudden, March 25th is introduced? What's that all about? He doesn't give dates like that in the book. And I'll tell you why he did that later. But that's just his thing. Okay, fine, he did something there that's kind of Catholic. Lewis, with Aslan being the Christ, has many more points of contact than Tolkien. But such points of contact with authentic Christianity as these are not enough to purify the whole. As I said in the beginning of this conference, at first sight of that chapel of the nuns, it was stunning. Wow! It looks so Catholic. But upon closer inspection, even though there were many similarities in places, it was Freemasonic. Something that is based on myth. It seems clear to me that all fantasy literature is a dead end and should be avoided. Now in the next conference, which is even more serious than this one, I hope to show you why books like The Lord of the Rings have been so successful at this moment of history. To end for now, let us repeat the profound words of St. Peter, our first pope, For we have not, by following artificial fables, mythos, made known to you the power and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were witnesses of his greatness. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, this voice coming down to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. We will please God and get to know Him, not through myths of any kind, but rather studying His divine revelation and knowing Christ Jesus, our King. Viva Cristo Rey! 